You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number 39. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Hi there, before you start listening to the interview with David Michel, a short heads up. In this recording we did have a few issues with sound quality. I record all interviews through Skype and although my guest and I do our best to get the best possible quality, sometimes the quality does suffer. I guess it has often to do with the internet connection available. Apologies, but I do hope you still enjoy the interview with David Michel and what he has to say about his businesses. Now let's get started with the interview. I'm very happy to welcome David Michel on the show today. David is the owner and executive director of Michel Wool, a wool broker and wool processing business. In 2002, David also started IO Merino, an Australian Merino wool performance base layer brand. Hello David, I'm happy to welcome you on the show today. How are you? Thank you. Uh, so far, excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, I think I gave a very brief introduction. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your career, and the work that you do in the wool industry today? Sure. Well, I've got uh, split between um, a full-time job, which is IO Merino, which is uh, really a very tiny part of our business, and the uh, the main part of my, my job, which is Michelle Wool. Michelle Wool's been going since uh, 1870. Uh, we are early stage processors of wool. Um, we, we buy from growers and we uh, clean the wool ready for spinning. So that, uh, that job uh, entails processing and handling best part of 20 million kilos a year of predominantly Australian wool. The other part is the Io Merino uh, portion, which takes up 90% of my time, but, but is actually uh, more of a uh, an MBA project than it is a business. Uh, we, we started uh, looking for um, marketing signals for our main wool business in about in the mid-90s, I think, and uh, worked out that the signals actually come from very, very close to retail. So uh, having done all the investigations, we thought we could build our own little retail business, and I.M. Marino was born in about 2002 making uh, base layer uh, wool garments um, that hopefully look uh, stylish and uh, provide the thermal protection that uh, we need, particularly in winter. And I always wonder, does IO stand for something in particular? Well, if I went back to the original marketing team, uh, they would talk about uh, uh, DNA, um, the base 10 being a universal you know, ones and zeros, uh, but now we refer to it as inside, outside. So well, what we have uh, works uh, particularly well outside in the elements and it also works very well inside and it keeps what's inside protected from the outside. Ah, yeah, and I did see, I was just looking through your Instagram and I saw like caps that said outsider, for example. So that's it. That's how you're well, the out Okay. Well, the outsiders are people who love to be outside and uh, they need uh, woolen protection, or we think they do anyway. Uh, the days of polyester and nylon and cotton keeping you warm when you're hiking is uh, very much old thinking. Okay, great. Well, thanks for, yeah, I was always wondering that's so good. I know I finally got the clue for that. And <laughs> you are like many people in the wool industry. Your family has a long history in wool as well. And can you tell a little bit about the, your family background um, and their involvement in the wool industry and maybe also talk how you then kind of got into wool as well? Okay, so the Michelle Wool business was founded in 1870 at a place around about 150 kilometres north of Adelaide in South Australia. And uh, that was started by the original G. H. Michelle, who was actually a, um, a tinker who repairs um, pots and pans. And he took uh, wool as payment for his repairs from the local farmers. And that sort of grew into a business where 
there was more wool to be moved back to uh, the United Kingdom for sale than there was pots and pans to be fixed. So uh, when he had four sons, they became very serious about this, and then they moved the business to, to Adelaide in the early 1900s. And we added over time scouring, uh, carbonising and top making to our uh, um, uh, skill set. And um, by the time we got to um, sort of the mid-70s, uh, uh, we outgrew the facility that we were in. We built a brand new facility north of Adelaide where we are still operating today. Um, and uh, there was more family involved and we're now up to generations uh, five my brother and I, Generation 5, and we purchased the business from our cousins in 2004. So we had 38 cousins who were all shareholders, and now there's only two of us. Wow, that's that's a lot of cousins, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what happens when you have a long business. Yeah, and but now it's probably easier to agree on things. Um, yeah, the, the big things are very easy. The small things are generally very hard. Um, uh, big things, for example, we, we built a factory in China in 2006. Um, well, that took us about five minutes uh, of discussing it over a filing cabinet to make that decision. Um, but uh, deciding things about uh, colours of logos, etc., can take months. <laughs> okay. Well, but at least you agree on the big things that are vital. That's true. And was it always clear for you that you would enter the wool industry? Or well, I, uh, yeah, my, my grandfather uh, showed me wool when I was about four or five. He took me down to the Adelaide Wool Sales, so he, he showed me what it was all about. Uh, and yes, I left school and went straight into the wool business uh, at age 18. Uh, but then at age 19, I left the wool business and went on a financial um, career. So I, I was a futures trader. I was in a currency trader for 10 years um, and was the uh, the head, the chief dealer at a bank that we actually had a joint venture with uh, called the National Bank of Detroit. So uh, I spent best part of 10 years in the financial markets, um, came back to wool in the uh, 90s and ended up in charge of the wool division and uh, then my brother and I took over in 2004 when, uh, when we bought the business. So I've not always been in wool, but I I've, I know enough about it to get into serious trouble. <laughs> that sounds good. And what do you think is important for companies that have been in a quite an old industry and for such a long time to to do to stay up to date and to continue business? How did yeah? What what did Michelle do to survive for such a long well, time? Well, you need you need a lot of luck for a start, so that that always plays a part. And then you need uh, very good people around you to help make the right decisions. Um, you also need to have uh, something that you're very good at, um, and uh, not get too uh, what's the word I'm after um, too confident in your abilities. So uh, the, the 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 day of sitting there just doing what you do without thinking about doing better uh, are long gone. You need to uh, keep uh, improving and re, uh, invigorating yourself uh, every year to uh, make sure you survive. And was then founding Io Marino part of that solution of, of surviving? Well, not really, no, because Io Marino is such a tiny part of our business. Um, I think uh, we might use maybe one and a half to two tons of wool a year. Um, for a people for a four person business that's that's still a fair bit of wool um, but really the wool business the Michelle wool business um, you know, turning you know, turning over 20 plus million kilos a year um, we actually need to uh, to focus very heavily on who our customers are uh, our costs and how do we service them better so I am really a bit of fun it's very hard work but it gives me a very good insight into what's happening at retail. Um, so uh, I'm always looking for signals that we can pass back to the main wool business to give us an early sign for demand. So it's a little bit like your own research and development exactly. for the bigger business. That's e mm. Exactly. But it mm. takes so much of my time, it's ridiculous. But uh, luckily, the I've got some a good team running our, our main wool processing business, so that's okay. Yeah, and talk a little bit about the challenges that you faced when you started Io Marino, and maybe then in contrast, what would be like your biggest challenge that you have today? How do they differ? 
Okay. Uh, when we started Aya Marino, there was very few uh, competitors. Uh, Icebreaker out of New Zealand was a competitor, and Smart Wolves just emerging, and there was a few American brands that were quite small. So it was a very tiny niche market. And uh, um, right now, I think uh, if we remember the, the conversation that we had with uh, Devold in IWTO in uh, – in the UK this year, they said they had 17 um, uh, competitors in uh, in the Baltic states, and I introduced myself as number 18. So um, there's a lot more uh, companies now trying to sell the wool story. Um, for me, many of them are compromising it by the introduction of synthetics. So I'm trying to stay pure, but that's because I have a wool background. Um, so. The evolution of Aya Marino uh, is that it's in a space now where there's far more competition. It's uh, just like any other brand now. So the biggest challenge right now for me in that little business is building the brand and the marketing piece, which is now uh, online, global, uh, whereas uh, when we started, it was probably quite local and uh, easy to do. But then for the wool piece, the, the, the main wool business, the main main challenge there is uh, costs uh, of processing, uh, whether it's in China or Australia, uh, that is um, trying to stay competitive. Mm. It's the and, biggest challenge. And when you started IO Marino, what sort of challenges did you have then? At the beginning? Um, uh, well, we didn't know what we didn't know. Uh, design... Uh, we had to learn marketing from the ground up. Uh, we had to, uh, uh, we actually had to change from um, through bricks and mortar distribution because uh, when the price of wool in 2010 doubled, the uh, ability to pass that price through to retail was about zero. So we decided to stop using bricks and mortar retail and uh, go online only. So that was an enormous learning curve because uh, online only. For anyone who's tried it, is not for faint-hearted, um, and it requires as much thought process as selling through bricks and mortar. It's just a different format. Okay, thanks for sharing that. I think that's quite helpful um, for anyone who also wants to venture in this area. And now you also have the perspective, kind of, of both sides of the supply chain. And you already said, it, you know. The IO Marino helps you with your wool business because you get key insights. But is there also something that you now better understand some of your customers in the wool, uh, Michelle wool business because you have this retail brand experience? One of the driving forces behind starting it was that um, we believed you could actually make um, as cheap a product with the right input if you use the right input from the beginning. So the challenge that the wool industry has is that it, it, it doesn't talk up and down the supply chain very well. It's very um, uh, adversarial um, uh, and, uh, and, and closed shop. So the challenge there is you don't get enough innovation to actually produce the right garment. So what we've found is that by buying the right wool and combing it and spinning it the, the, the correct way, you can actually make a better garment um, at the right price point that still works um, than you can if you actually have everybody trying to buy the cheapest uh, they can and process, process it the cheapest they can to meet a price point at retail. So that was a huge learning for us. So are you then advising your clients in, in a better way with this knowledge? Well, we try, but the challenge is when you are advising a customer who says he knows more about it than I do, then I'm very careful about how I float that concept because that's, uh, that's like a farmer telling me how I should make the blends to put in my wool, the wool that I sell. <laughs> that doesn't really work either. Yeah, okay, I understand. Um, and earlier you said that in the beginning you were more focusing on Australia as a um, key market for Aya Marino and now you've gone global. But with, do you have some key markets where you... Um, market Io Marino specifically? Well, basically our market is the world. Uh, the only limitation for us really are taxes and duties. <clears throat> um, so we can deliver to America in two days from Australia. We can deliver to Europe within two days. Uh, the challenge I've got is going to Europe. The, uh, the VAT taxes can be anything up to 40%, which really kills the whole thought process of Europe. 
So uh, we're trying very hard to work out how to manage that. Um, but at the moment, uh, America and Australia are the two markets for us. Yeah, and I, th I always find that um, as you can attract customers around the world, that um, it's difficult if you cannot ship to them because consumers kind of expect um, that you... Well, we can. The yeah, problem is when you get another, another bill from the government yeah, uh, exactly. saying you, it really kills the whole mm. the premise. So. Yeah. Um, But that's difficult to, to tell the consumer, so I think... Well, that's true. So... <laughs> <laughs> But we are in uh, we, we sorry we were in 300 stores across North America and Europe up until 2010. Um, but the cost of distribution is very expensive, um, so it wasn't a robust model because we were making quite a small volume. So really, the the distribution model works okay if you're making enough volume. Um, so as a small niche brand that we are. Um, Uh, that makes runs of, you know, a few, a few hundred, not a few tens of thousands. Um, our cost structure is a bit higher than most, so we've got to be a bit smarter on how we deliver to our customers. Mm, okay. Thank you for that. And then another area I wanted to touch upon with you is um, social media, because I see you're mm -hmm. quite active on Facebook and Instagram. And I just wanted to better understand, you know, what role is social media playing in your marketing and also... Where do you see um, which platform works best for your brand? Okay, so again, as the world is our marketplace, um, the only way that someone can see us is on social media or direct electronic um, uh, emails. So we have a, um, a drive to build the numbers of um, people on our database that we can send emails to, um, and we... We don't inundate them, but we are carefully measured in how many emails we send per week, per month, etc. And we have to have special deals that keeps them interested. But to back that up, we use Facebook because you can very much target your your marketplace on Facebook as to who sees it, who doesn't see it, uh, by age group, demographic, in terms of geography. Um, are they hikers? Are they skiers? Are they uh, people who just live in a big city? So you can actually go to the people most likely to um, want to use your product. So that uh, is all part of the the, um, the selling game. Uh, if I was in bricks and mortar and shops around the world, I'd be paying probably the same amount of money to have someone uh, walk up to a shop and saying, here's, I've got a, a whole bag full of clothes I want you to have a look at. Um, so instead of spending that sort of money, we do it via social media by saying, showing our photos, other people's photos, uh, having a lifestyle blog, um, all to make us look interesting and believable as a brand. So you're actually also making use of Facebook ads, if that's what I understood. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Okay. Everything. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> and um, I also see that you have quite um, professional looking images. Um, is that also something where you invest in? Yep. Nothing's free. So uh, if you want to look professional, you've got to pay for it. So uh, if we were going to put a, um, a big billboard up in the local uh, sporting store, we'd have to go and uh, hire models and have photographic uh, uh, sessions done. We do exactly the same thing for all our photos other than for those photos that are of customers who are seen using our products, which are very much the... Um, uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, amateur uh, photographs. Mm. So you have like a fan base who actually send you their photos or post them on your... Correct. And also if you look at our blog on the iamarino.com page, um, you'll see that there's lots of stories about people using our gear. So not only do we uh, pay people to have their photographs, we also give gear away for those people who are about to do something particularly adventurous in our gear um, that will actually um, help spread the word. Okay, that's really helpful to understand. And another thing I saw is that you're also sponsoring sporting events. And I, when I talk to other people, they find it quite difficult to decide which event to sponsor and they're not always sure if they actually get a good return on investment on their sponsorship. Do you have some advice on how you do it? Well, 
the, the major one, the major event that we sponsor is part of the world tour of uh, trail running, and it's called the Ultra Trail Australia Race, which is at a place called Katoomba. Uh, so if you're in Sydney uh, and you looked to the uh, west, you would see the Blue Mountains, and it's in the Blue Mountains. And the reason we sponsor that is because five years ago I actually ran this race. So it's a 100-kilometre trail race uh, with 4,000 metres of vertical uh, in it as well. So it's it's a pretty uh, interesting process. So I did it in about 20-ish hours, uh, which was uh, a lot of fun. I was dressed completely in wool, so it actually works. So when the opportunity, uh, opportunity arose to um, to sponsor it, because the, uh, it used to be called the North Face 100, but North Face pulled out because their range of clothing didn't really fit the demographic. We stepped in and said, well, here we are. That's a, that's a great thing for us to do because we know it from the inside out. So I think if you're going to invest in a sporting event, you've either got to have some credibility in the event. Um, someone has to have done it to understand what you need. Otherwise, you're just another brand selling something that's colourful. Okay. And do you also distribute uh, your products to the people participating? or? Yeah, we, we take uh, – well, we, we were – at Katoomba in May, and we took uh, 20, uh, 32 boxes of clothing, and uh, we sold quite a lot of it when we were there. So we were there for two days at the at the expo. So we were mandatory uh, base layer gear because it can get very cold in the mountains in winter, and uh, people were coming to us for advice on what they should wear, uh, in what circumstances, and we could actually talk to them about the trails they're about to run, and whereabouts they'd need to start thinking about putting the gear on. And uh, uh, I think uh, for us it was an extremely successful um, sponsorship. Okay. And, yeah, and I think that um, also shows that as a brand you're also kind of a guide and, you know, you help your consumers have yep. a better We're also a major so, – yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we've also picked up a, the local um, trail running association here in South Australia – Uh, we're also sponsoring the hiking associations here as well. So there's a bit of a, a trail theme, an outdoor theme that we actually follow up on. And it's all because we've actually run the trails here and we've hiked them so we know where we're talking about. So knowing what you're talking about makes a big difference. Yeah, and I think it's also this extra, you know, that's like an extra service that you can give information about the trails mm -hmm. and, you know, when to put it on. Like That's really valuable information that, that gives you the extra yep. edge. And there was one more question I wanted to ask you uh, about a topic earlier when you said that um, going back to your wool, Michelle Wool business, that um, you know the supply chain is not really talking enough with each other. Do you have a suggestion how that could be improved? Yeah, look, it's difficult. It's easy to say that um, the supply chain doesn't talk. Uh, we all get together, uh, you know, several times a year at various events around the world. And everyone's polite, but there's no actual exchange of technical um, um, results. And look, I can understand why. It's all it's all sort of commercial and confident stuff. So you can't give away your IP, otherwise somebody else is going to steal it from you. So it's a bit of a challenge. Um, we're involved in a few supply chains uh, around the world, and I've been in a room with an end retailer plus a spinner and a, a knitter and me, And we can't. We even then have trouble getting to the same agreement. So it all comes down in the end to price, and that sort of gets in the way of a lot of very interesting and positive uh, outcomes. So I don't actually have a solution. I can I can see why it doesn't work, but I can't see what the magic um, uh, catalyst would be to actually get us all talking together okay. in a constructive <laughs> way. Well, there needs to be still some issues that we can work on. So. That's one of Maybe. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, David. Um, before we close, what is the best way for our listeners to find out more about IO Merino and Michelle Wu? Where should they go? Well, going online for IO Merino, so it's iomerino.com. Uh, we have a European and a US and an Australian site, and we can deliver to anybody within about two days. Europeans, be careful of taxes and duties. It's not within my scope to... Uh, to get rid of those, but we're trying very hard. But um, we do make what I think is probably the best uh, wool-based layer uh, out there. 
Uh, we've done that because we started with uh, how to make the best yarn possible, and I think it makes a huge difference. For Michelle Wool, that's more the industrial end, um, michellewool.com.au. Uh, you'll find us in China uh, and also in Australia. Uh, for greasy wool, carbonised wool and scoured wool are our specialties, and um, we're processing and handling a bit more than 20 million kilos a year, so we're a, a large part of the Australian wool industry. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for um, providing those details and I'll share them also in the show notes so anyone interested can go there and link directly up with you. Well, I wish you much further success with what you say is kind of your side hustle at IO Merino, but also with your big business, Michelle Wool, and all the best. Thank you. <laughs> thank you and have a good day. Cheers. Bye. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode with David Michel. Check out Michelle Wool and Io Marino by visiting the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 039. That is elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 039. Also, I started a little newsletter that I send out twice per month. In the newsletter, I share my most recent blog posts, podcast episodes and other interesting news articles that are related to wool and the fashion industry. I would love it if you join my mailing list and receive the newsletter on a regular basis. You can sign up at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash newsletter. That is all for today. Talk to you again next week and bye for now.